So, as you will have seen from the news, the big issue this week in the Lords has been the Lords yet once more throwing out the Commons amendments, or rather the Commons uh, decision not to accept the Lords amendments and to basically get themselves into a ping pong situation whereby the Rwanda bill is no longer able to go through before Easter. I, as I've said many times, and I said yesterday in the chamber, I've no friend of this Rwanda bill, which seems to me to be petty-minded and liberal and not addressing the core issues. And the fact that Rishi Sunak has chosen to get stuck on it, it's like getting stuck on a molehill on what's, in what's, on what's die, rather than, you know, kind of some mountain of principle. But having said all of that, the opposition to this bill in the Lords is just utterly insufferable. The thing that's really, I had no intention of speaking yesterday, but the thing that's really, in, you know, annoying and galling is that whereas you can legally pull holes in the bill, the fact that the likes of Jacob Rees Mogg and Lee Anderson voted against this very bill, <laughs> they voted to defeat it, you remember, um, because it's so, you know, it's got so much wrong with it that it doesn't work even within its own terms, um, would indicate that you shouldn't be defending this bill blindly. And I'm sure that technically you can actually tear it apart. And that's what the Lords have done, fair enough, put some amendments in. But when you hear the tone of the debate, it is from a position of self-righteous superiority and always with this idea that there's something grubby about caring that people are coming into the country illegal. It's always assumed that everybody who claims that they're an asylum seeker genuinely is. Nobody takes any notice of A, security problems, you don't know who's on the boats because they haven't got any information, or B, the strain that it puts on local services, the hotels issue and so on. All of that somehow gets swept away by people talking about being kind and uh, empathetic and compassionate. I just couldn't stand it. And then, just as I was getting wound up, a, a Labour Lord, Lord Lipsy, had the nerve to stand up and say, we constitutionally are not supposed to overthrow anything the Commons does, um, because, but I think now is a time when we should, in extreme circumstances. And then Baroness Jones from the Green Party said that actually, if you wanted an example of tyrann tyrannical government and of authoritarianism, the Commons was it, whereas the Lords were liberal and enlightened. In other words, the elected chamber, the people who the people of this country have voted for, were described as tyrannical and the saviours were the unelected members of the House of Lords. So I lost my temper and got up, said a few words as you can see below. The thing that happened while I did it was as soon as I stood up to speak and I let everybody have a go, the usual suspects, um, I stood up and the back benches, the Labour back benches groaned and signed and all this. And it's so tempting to want to kind of like snap their heads off and just say something rude and everything and intemperate. Because it's an attempt at intimidation and bullying, you know? We've had that discussion about how in the House of Commons everybody's very bright on and sanctimonious about we don't want intimidation or the wrong kind of language unless you're arguing something to disagree with, in which case they act like the bully boys that they really are. So they did it. So I kind of stared them out. I don't know if you can see that, but I stared them out. And then at one point somebody interrupted when I was speaking and I kind of glowered. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because I thought that was my news tactic. And I was actually quite pleased when a crossbencher stopped me in the corridor and said, actually, Baroness Fox, you did look like rather that hard girl in school when it only took one look to know that we had to run away or we'd be a fight, there'd be a fight or a scrap. And as somebody said to me afterwards, until they went to state school, because you don't really have scraps in private schools as far as I know, and I don't know. Anyway, the Rwanda bill, you know, trundles on. For those who really think anything serious has happened, it hasn't, because the Labour front bench, let me tell you, are gonna let this bill through. And I actually gave them a challenge, you know, why don't you let it through, then when you're in power, which we assume they will be, tear it up, start again. You're capable of doing that and of um, creating something. But they won't, they haven't committed, by the way, to getting rid of this bill. They're just trying to stop it, but then they won't stop it, but God knows what they'll do. So that's that. The other um, uh, things that I spoke on this week were on the uh, attempt by the Conservative government to ban um, the BDS movement from affecting public sector organisations. BDS is the boycott and divestment and sanctions uh, campaign largely associated with boycotting Israel. 
and I really am a firm believer in the absolutely pernicious anti-semitic and reactionary censorious nature of BDS but as usual the Conservative Party in government just missed the mark because they've managed to create a bill that is limited on the one hand to only tackling those aspects of um, boycotting that are to do with divestment in terms of you know divestment in different management funds or, or uh, pension funds or those kind of high level issues and on the other hand it's so broad that it manages to criminalize anybody who tries to persuade somebody to uh, support BDS what? or um, in a situation where it says you can never take a, a moral stance or a political stance on a matter of foreign policy I mean you can't make it up the wording is terrible and the minister constantly looks like she's struggling. The other thing is, is that whereas it was originally aimed at councils and local government, and that's bad enough, they managed to expand public authorities to include universities, which will completely cancel out the work that they did in relation to the Higher Education Academic Freedom Bill. Because it doesn't really matter whether you think that there's a, a, an illiberal censorious attempt at not working with Israeli universities or what have you, which I think is terrible, and actually cancelling Israeli, young Israeli PhD students, not letting them get the funding, or not letting UK students go to Israel to study, any of that's terrible. But there's two things. One, um, you can't ban that from happening. You have to have an argument in public because otherwise you are interfering in academic freedom. This is the government that are going to be doing this and the criminal law. But secondly, this bill doesn't, even as it happens, really cover that. It only covers whether the university management has a pension fund that it withdraws from Israel. So the whole thing is a mess. So I did a bit of bobbing up and down and jumping up and down on that issue. Um, just on uh, the issue of Israel, I went to see a, a, a fantastic documentary that was shown in Parliament um, yesterday called Hashtag Nova, which was a film entirely comprising of self-filmed clips from people at the Nova Music Festival on October the 7th, you know, and it's the first part of it is people, you know, putting up daft films of themselves on TikTok dancing and it's all love and peace and everyone's off their head and it's very joyous and it's you have a dread all the way through as you're watching it but it's all like that and it's then the slow unfurling on social media as they experience it and that they send to their parents or their mates or the what have you of young people suddenly going oh there's fireworks oh no it's bomb oh my god and then the gradual oh my god it's the most harrowing thing i've ever seen uh, it also includes s similar young people of their age on motorbikes driving in shouting Allah Akbar with, with a kind of bloodthirsty cry and a sense of death impending that I won't forget for a long time. Um, I'm going to try and get that film to be widely shown. I'm hoping we might show it at uh, events like Living Freedom or at the Battle of Ideas. It's a brilliant documentary because it doesn't editorialise. It doesn't say anything really, it just shows you this and you kind of know, but it tells a story. Incredibly, a wide range of networks uh, that could stream it or put it on TV, said it's too political, partisan. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, why? Because it actually shows what happened on October the 7th and that's not fashionable. So I hope we can get that widely seen. And actually I will be going to Israel myself on a, on a, a visit on Sunday for four days and we'll be visiting the site of the Nova Music Festival. So I kind of feel that as one of the many things I'm doing. Um, it's with a certain dread that I do it. But also, there was something about seeing even the terror of those young people and their last messages to their parents. Oh, I'm going to cry again. The last messages. So many of the lads, you know, like so cool and so on. And they're all going, Mum, Mum, oh God, I love you and all that. It's terrible. But anyway, there was something about their messages that also were so life affirming, even though, in fact, at the end, they show you the people that you've seen filming themselves as dead or kidnapped still hostages and so on and so forth anyway that was that but i'm going to israel and i'm going because i think it's important that i don't just I, I, by the way i don't know what's happening with the famine i genuinely don't know what to believe and i'm looking at all of the statistics i'm not just going to believe something because israel says it i'm not an idiot but i i can't get over the fact that in the house of Lords and in so often in the media they just repeat the propaganda that's coming out of pro Hamas forces and I would have thought that we all need to take a step back and be a bit more skeptical or critically minded or open-minded so when people stand up in the House of Lords 
and say that Israel is purposefully starving the people of Gaza. I think that is really despicable and it's a, it's a misuse of the confusion about what's really happening. But nonetheless, I'm gonna go with an open mind and see what I find out and see what I hear. The, the final thing I wanted to say was that um, today I did a podcast interview with The Spectator magazine on the new hate crime bill in Scotland. That's just um, been announced and that is going to be uh, uh, unveiled or come into law on April the 1st. It's, it's incredibly draconian. We, we know that it's expanding the law into pri uh, distinct, making no distinction between private and public spaces. You can, you know, listen to the podcast uh, interview. But it's, it's one thing I wanted to be wary of. A, it's too often the case that the only people who are really making a fuss about this bill are the people who are sex realists or gender critical. It's almost like it's all about JK Rowling. But I think it's very important to note that Police Scotland themselves said that the people they were focusing on were 18 to 30 year old uh, white, they said white, not me, males, um, from, you know, deprived socioeconomic background. I mean, basically this is a bill aimed at uh, criminalising the white working class. So although gender critical feminists, and this is terrible, will be caught up in it, so will anybody and anybody who somebody accuses of hate. We should remember that it's often ordinary people who are demonised in this way. And in that sense, um, I think we need to look very carefully what's happening in Scotland. It reflects what's happening in Ireland. It says that you can't even have conversations that somebody else might describe as hateful in your kitchen, in your home. Uh, in, to your mates in the pub, if somebody else hears it and reports you, then that's going to uh, cause pr problems. And the Irish hate crime bill is very similarly draconian. Anyone who's complacent about it happening in England and Wales, uh, watch this space, I'm afraid, because we know that the seeds have been sown for um, criminalising hate. And I'm afraid that if you look at the complete mess this government made on the extremism, uh, uh, the attacks on extremism, where instead of having the courage to say we're going to take on Islamism, which we're worried about, they then broaden it out so it's all extremism. The next minute you know it's everybody's far right. They themselves get accused of being extremists because of some of their views, like around the Rwanda bill, and they don't really know what to go. But what ends up happening is that speech itself is blamed for political problems and people who say the wrong thing can find themselves on the wrong side of the law. So that's obviously something which I will be raising in the House of Lords in the future, but is definitely something which at the Academy of Ideas we're going to be doing a deep dive into, not just going for the headlines, but actually trying to do something about practically ensuring that free speech is not killed off by either the Scottish Government or indeed the UK Government.